Hello everyone. Our today's topic is the longest bone of the human body, the femur. It's almost 45 cm long in an adult and it comprises almost one fourth of the total height of the body. As it is a long bone, it comprises of a proximal end, a distal end and an intervening shaft. And the anatomical position is the head is directed upward, forward and medially. There is a forward bowing of the shaft. The two condyles lies inferiorly and the intercondylar fossa lies posteriorly and the linea aspera is also lies posteriorly. So these are the anatomical points. Now as it is, it is a long bone, it, is, it has mainly three parts, the proximal end, the distal end, the shaft. First we will talk about the proximal end. It has a globular head, a constricted net and two trochanters, the greater trochanter and this is the lesser trochanter. First we talk about the head. It is, a, it is a spherical in shape, there is a depression in the center, it is called fovea. It is for the attachment of the ligamentum teres femoris, which is the remnant of the artery teres femoris, uh, which was a branch of the obturator artery, sometimes it was the branch of the middle circumflex femoral artery. It, uh, it's in the mature bone, it does not have any purpose, but in the growing bone, it actually serves some area around the head, the blood supply. Except this fovea, the whole of the head is articular. Then we will go to the neck. It has an upper border, a lower border, an anterior surface and a posterior surface. The lower border of the neck, has it, it has a bony buttress. It's called the calcar femoral. It's for the weight bearing part of the neck. After the neck, we have this. This is the greater trochanter. This is the lesser trochanter. There is a, in case of greater trochanter, there is an upper border, a posterior border, it has a lateral surface, a medial surface and an anterior surface. Then we will go to the muscle attachment. The medial surface of the greater trochanter has a depression, it is called trochanteric fossa. The trochanteric fossa gives insertion to the obturator externus. Behind the trochanteric fossa, there is a depression on the greater trochanter medial surface, it serves insertion of the obturator internus and superior and inferior gamelae. The upper border of the greater trochanter, superior posteriorly, there is a epical or top of the greater trochanter receives insertion of the pyriformis. Anterior surface of the greater trochanter gives attachment of the gluteus minimus. There is an oblique ridge on the lateral surface of the greater trochanter which receives insertion of the gluteus medius and posteriorly it receives gluteus maximus. So these three gluteal muscles are attached here up in the proximal part of the femur. There is a uh, and there is a this is the in the posterior part of the femur this is intertrochanteric crest and anterior part it is intertrochanteric line. In intertrochanteric crest is the middle part, there is a quadrate tubercle for the attachment of the muscle quadratus femoris. Then in the lesser trochanter, we have the insertion of iliopsoas. Um, the upper part gives insertion of the psoas major and the lower part gives insertion of the iliacus muscle. There is a two bursa in the greater trochanter, one is on the lateral surface, one is on the posterior surface to uh, between the tendon of the gluteus muscles and between the bones. One important thing to remember here, these two trochanters actual, actually the traction epiphysis. That means two trochanters have originated from the muscle pull. So this is a very important thing to know. Then we will go to the shaft. The, uh, the shaft has three surfaces. This is the anterior surface. This is the medial surface sometimes it's called posterior medial surface this is a lateral surface or sometimes it is called the posterior lateral surface it has three borders it has a medial border it has a lateral border it has a posterior border the posterior border is actually the linear aspera which diver which is actually most prominent in the middle third of the shaft in the upper third the linear aspera diverges and also in the lower third it diverges again in the upper third it diverges and forms in the medially it forms the spiral line and in laterally it forms the lateral aspect of the gluteal tuberosity it's a fun fact that gluteal tuberosity is sometimes called the third trochanter of the femur in the lower part the linear aspera again diverges and forms the medial supracondylar line and in lateral supracondylar line 
So we are getting two more surfaces here in the upper part between the spiral line and gluteal la lateral part of the linea aspera there is the posterior surface and the lower part there is the popliteal surface. So in the anterior surface upper three foot and uh, anterior and lateral surface both surface gives origin to the vastus intermedius in the upper three foot of the shaft. In the posterior segment there is the linea aspera. Linea aspera has medial lip, lateral lip and an intermedial lip. The medial lip gives rise to the medial intermuscular septa. The lateral lip gives rise to the lateral intermuscular septa. The posterior lip gives rise to the posterior intermuscular septa. So these three septa divides the muscles of the uh, thigh into three compartments. Anterior compartment, posterior compartment, one medial compartment. Now, between the medial intermuscular septa and the lateral intermuscular septa lies the anterior compartment which is that and each compartment has its own nerve and it is the femoral nerve. Now, between the medial intermuscular septa and posterior intermuscular septa lies the medial compartment. Medial compartment is actually formed by adductor group of muscles and between the posterior intermuscular septa and lateral intermuscular septa there is the posterior compartment is of the hamstring group of muscles. So in the anterior compartment first we will talk about the vastus medialis. It will give its origin from the lower part of the intertrochanteric line then it will go to the spiral line then it will go to the medial lip of the linea aspera then it will go it will continue going continue going and up to the upper three up to the upper two third of the medial supracondylar line it will take the origin of the vastus medialis then we will go to vastus lateralis it will start taking its origin from the upper part of the intertrochanteric line that when it will go anterior inferiorly from the greater trochanter then will passes it will pass through the lateral part of the gluteal tuberosity then it will go to the lateral part of the linea aspera into the upper th upper half of the shaft so this is the origin of the vastus medialis and vastus lateralis then we will talk about the adductor muscles adductor the uh, before adductor muscle we will uh, talk about the pectineus which just takes a uh, insertion in the up just below the lesser trochanter it takes its insertion here below the pectineus the origin of adductor brevis will start it will end in the half of the shaft and just in that linear line the lower half will give origin to the adductor longus at brevis means closer longus means the distance just lateral to adductor brevis and longus it will take the origin of adductor magnus and it will continue up to the this to the medial supracondylar and up to the adductor tubercle now we will talk about the posterior segment which lies between the posterior intermuscular septa and the lateral intermuscular septa. The, it's actually comprised of the hamstring group of muscles but the hamstring group of muscle does not take origin from this bone rather uh, e except the hamstring muscle the short head of biceps femoris takes origin from this bone and it takes its origin from the intermediate part of the li linea aspera up to the upper half of the lateral supracondylar line after the latter after the lateral intermuscular septa it again begin the anterior, anterior compartment of the thigh so it's again we will go to the vastus lateralis then vastus intermedius so if someone asks what are the muscle attachment of the posterior part of the femur from medial to lateral we will say from from the most medial part it will the vastus medialis then we will go to the pectineus below it will be adductor brevis then adductor longus after that will be adductor magnus then will there will be the posterior intermuscular septa then it will be the short head of biceps femoris after that it will be the lateral intermuscular septa after that it will be the vastus lateralis and in the lateral surface it will be the vastus intermedius so this is the actual the sh short in summary one line the attachment of the posterior surface of the shaft of the femur and uh, this is actually a bit unknown diagram but uh, if we take a close look in the uh, middle one third of the posterior surface of the femur and if it is taken very closely we will see a diagram like this these two brown part are actually the boundaries of the bone and from medial to lateral first of all the vastus medialis then this blue line it is the 
middle intermuscular septa. After the blue line, it will the adductor brevis in the upper part, adductor longus in the lower part. And after this adductor, two adductor muscles, it will be the adductor magnus, the very bulky muscle adductor magnus after these two muscles. After the finishing of the adductor compartment, it will the posterior intermuscular septa in this blue line. And after the posterior intermuscular septa, there will be the beginning of the hamstring group of muscles. But uh, short head of biceps femoris, which is not a part of the hamstring group of muscles, will take origin from the this region of the femur. After this origin of the muscle, there is the lateral intermuscular septa. And after lateral intermuscular septa, this is the vastus lateralis. And after the vastus lateralis, we will see the vastus intermedius muscles. So this is the structures from medial to lateral in case of a right femur. Now here is the diagram. It, it is the shaft, the middle third of the shaft of the femur. This is the linear aspera. I have drawn it a bit broad to make it understand easily. There is a three intermuscular septa. There is the medial intermuscular septa. There is the lateral intermuscular septa. There is the posterior intermuscular septa. All of the septa will diverge from the deep fascia. The lat lateral intermuscular septa, the thickest of them, will merge in the iliotibial tract. Between the medial intermuscular septa and posterior intermuscular septa, there is the medial compartment. In the lateral intermuscular septa, posterior intermuscular septa is the posterior compartment. In the lateral intermuscular septa and medial intermuscular septa is the anterior compartment. Each compartment has, has its own muscles and own nerve supply. Anterior compartment is supplied by the femoral nerve. Medial compartment is supplied by the obturator nerve. The posterior compartment is supplied by the sciatic nerve. Then we will go to the lower part of the femur. It actually comprises of the two condyles, one medial condyle to lateral condyles. One important thing, the middle supracondylar line will end in the adductor tubercle. It's a bony prominent with very, very important. The one first importance is it provides attachment of the hamstring part of the adductor muscle group. And the second importance is the epiphyseal line passes through this bone. So uh, someone can determine the age of the dead fetus or the li uh, life born dead born by, no by this knowledge that epiphyseal line passes through this part of the bone. One interesting thing here to know that adductor magnus starts to take its origin from the upper part of the shaft and ends in the adductor magnus but here there is a opening or there is a gap between the muscle it's known as the hiatus magnum which allows the vessels of the anterior compartment like femoral artery and other vessels to pass to the posterior part that means the popliteal surface and continue as the popliteal artery so this is the part after from where the popliteal surface begins in the medial condyle there is a elevation called medial epicondyle medial epicondyle gives origin to the tibial collateral ligament and in case of lateral epicondyle it gives rise to the fibular collateral ligament just above the medial condyle there is a depression which gives origin to the medial head of the gastrocnemius muscle in case of the lateral condyle the upper part and actually it's the ending part of the lateral supracondylar line it gives origin to the plantaris muscle the tendon of plantaris is the longest tendon in the body so it's a nice thing to know in in case of lateral condyle and below the lateral epicondyle there is a depression and it gives origin to the popliteus muscle uh, we should remember that uh, the capsule of the, the synovial joint of the knee joint passes above this line so popliteus the origin of popliteus muscle is actually intrasynovial intracapsular so it's not intrasynovial it's intracapsular just above the lateral epicondyle there is a, again there is a depression which gives origin to the lateral head of gastrocnemius then in the anterior compartment we will see that the capsule of hip joint will pass through this line but a pouch of synovial fluid will come up to at least this part it's actually called the suprapatellar bursa suprapatellar bursa is one of the huge important thing in case of knee clinical problems and is is often infected and there's often accumulation of excess fluid in this bursa so there is a muscle called articularis genu here which keeps the bursa in its position and remove and removes it from its upward displacement there are also many bursa around this knee joint and knee joint is the most largest joint of the 
human body another important thing here is the cruciate ligaments there are two cruciate ligaments anterior cruciate ligament and posterior cruciate ligament there is the medial condyle is the lateral condyle and is the there is the lateral surface of the medial condyle and is the medial surface of the lateral condyles and the anterior inferior part of the lateral surface of the medial condyle which is actually the med medial surface of the intercondylar fossa gives insertion of the posterior cruciate ligament as it is opposite in the lateral part of the intercondylar fossa and the posterior superior part it gives insertion of the anterior cruciate ligament and anterior cruciate ligament is the single most important thing so that mankind has got his upright posture so it's very important the and after that it it forms the knee joint with this tibia and part of the patella and there is also meniscus there is the two meniscus here the lateral meniscus and medial meniscus there are three important angles which are peculiar in case of femur and we should know the angles one is if we draw a line in the from the center of the head and neck and one line from the posterior part of the the two condyles then it will march and create an angle it is a 15 degree it is called the angle of antiversion or it's also known as the angle of femoral torsion there is another angle we will see in the shaft and the neck this is called the shaft neck angle which is actually 126 degree in case of adult and in case of chill child it's 150 degree there is another angle which is caused by the uh, we already know that fem uh, the two corners in the femur lie in the same horizontal plane so and but it's actually deviated from the midline so there is the angle between the shaft of the femur and shaft of the radius it's almost 170 degree and it's also a very important angle to know so uh, that is the femur uh, in short and i hope you guys have liked the video and if any suggestions and if any comments uh, please let us know and don't forget to sh subscribe share and like this video and don't forget to subscribe the carousel bd channel thank you everyone